Well, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our presenters. They are uh, Reverend Breen Sipes. Uh, Breen is usually a pastor and is currently a full-time parent. She lives in North Platte at this point and has been experimenting in cross-generational ministry since arriving on the territory of the Nebraska Synod eight years ago. She uh, is a member of the Growing God's Generous Generations Network. We call that the 4G Network here in the Nebraska Synod. It's a relatively new group that works to get you resources on cross-generational ministry to use in your setting. Good afternoon, friends. I am so excited to be back with Lunch with Lisa and so glad to be able to share some more information about cross-gen ministry. Um, I have been intentionally working in cross-generational ministry and digital ministry for the last eight years, but I've really benefited from cross-generational ministry my entire life. I was lucky enough to grow up in a community where my entire extended family lived within easy driving distance, like half an hour driving distance. So my growing up was a cross-generational um, experience and it was really easy for me. It wasn't something that we had to go and seek out. I also had lots of um, adults in my life who were willing to take an interest in me, um, both through Sons of Norway and also at church. And I am so glad that I, I had that opportunity and that my children now also have that opportunity. I'm 42 years old. And the world has changed, maybe not as much as it has for some of you, but now it seems that many um, families are more scattered. So regular, actual, related families might not live within a half an hour of one another, which gives us a good excuse and a good reason to start cross-generational ministry within our contexts. Also, if you really think about it, the, one of the only places where multiple generations gather on a regular basis is our churches. It didn't used to be that, way, but it certainly is now. And it makes no sense to me to ignore that wonderful resource that we have of all different generations gathering together, even if it looks different in this time of pandemic. Even if you serve in a family-related church, a small church like I was just previously, where it seems like everybody is related, right? There are still going to be people within your churches who have scattered families, who long to be with other generations, who'd love to connect with those who are close by in proximity or brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, we don't have any children or youth in our church, remember that the seven generations which are currently on our planet, five of them are adults. So five of our generations are adults and cross-generational ministry can be done with just adults if that's who it is that you have. And I actually think it's really helpful to recognize the differences in the generations. Sometimes we just group all adults as adults and that there are some differences between them. Today, what I'm gonna share with you are some guiding principles that are based on my experience um, of, of living this cross-generational ministry out in context. Now I'm going to share my screen. All right, would you give me a thumbs up if you can see that screen? Thank you, my friends. First, I have to show you my beautiful bread that I've been baking lately. I think of these guiding principles that I'm going to share with you as a tested baking recipe. I say baking specifically because my husband and I have very different ways of cooking. My husband never uses a recipe. He often changes things up. And what he has learned, I hope from me, is that baking really requires a little more precision <laughs> and that it requires every ingredient every time. You can't skip the yeast or it's not gonna rise. You can't skip having some kind of flour, some kind of sweetener, some kind of oil, and that each of those ingredients are necessary. All of them at the same time are necessary in uh, making bread rise and also I believe in making um, cross-generational ministry work. So to tie it with our promises or our 
prayer that we say at baptism in the Lutheran tradition, Holy Spirit, stop in us a spirit of experimentation, teamwork, vibrancy, curiosity, invitation, and tenacity. So the first one, oh, I lost my first slide. Sorry about that, everybody. Lost my first slide. Yeah, it's gone. Um, my, the first um, guiding principle is a principle of experimentation. Um, I am famous for try and experiment. The nice part about experiments when you're introducing cross-generational ministry is that experiments don't last forever. Experiments can be tweaked or changed as you go. Experiments can help us to dive into the deep end or just get our feet wet. So sometimes the, the roadblock is we don't know how to do this. When, if we introduce an experiment, we can just try it all. And if it didn't work, the experiment failed and we try something different. Or if you have people who are a little bit less excited about trying that kind of a thing, having an experiment lets us just take one little step, a little step into the deep end, then evaluate, see if we want to continue and then move on. Also, experiments are meant to be evaluated. At the end of each experiment, we say, what did we learn? And how will this learning guide our future work? So beginning with a, night, with a spirit of experimentation really helps us to go in curious and go in willing to tweak and change and move on the fly. The second spirit is a spirit of teamwork. It's my part of my 4G network team that I've really enjoyed being a part of, especially during this time of pandemic. And this is how we meet, right? When you're thinking about your spirit of teamwork, you think that when we work together, the work is sustainable. It's really hard to keep something like this going all by yourself. And so it's really helpful to build a team. In your context, you can think, who is ready for a new thing? I think of my friend, Laura, who's always ready to try the newest, whatever it is, and just ready to jump on that bandwagon. Who has an open mind and willing hands? Who are the people who are just willing to take the direction and make it go? Who keeps showing up as a participant? My friend, Susie, just kept showing up and kept showing up and kept showing up until I finally said, hey, you want to help make this go? And then because this is cross-generational ministry, how many different generations can you include in your, in your team? And this might actually be a strength of small congregations because it is all hands on deck. Everybody has to help or it's not going to go. The third spirit is a spirit of vibrancy. Here are two sisters who are an amazing quilting team who also um, decided to help during cross-generational um, ads work our hands Sunday to make uh, hide blankets for our local um, children's shelter. And so they were really excited to be a part of it. And you can see that. As Kristen is famous for saying, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. If you have something vibrant going on in your congregation, is there a way that you can tap into generations, that you can intentionally and consistently invite more generations to participate. This also leads to the question, what might need to change to encourage more participation? And being honest about that right up front, I think is one of the keys to making cross-gen go. Um, if it means that we have to change from two o'clock on a Tuesday to Sunday morning, is that really gonna work? Is that, are the ones who are already vibrant willing? And then, and this is maybe coming from my small congregations. What exciting ministry do you have going on that needs a few more people to make it go? Sometimes you have great ideas and great people, but if you add more generations, if you widen that invitation, perhaps that vibrancy will lead to sustainability. The fourth spirit is the spirit of curiosity. This is my dad and my oldest daughter. <laughs> um, we, one thing that we cultivate during cross-generational ministry is that every generation is still learning, that all of us still have something to learn. And 
that all of us are invited to be curious. That's the look on my dad's face, in my opinion. He's there because he wants to learn from my daughter, and he is totally willing to throw down everything he ever knew to learn from her. We intentionally encourage each learner to be open to the spirit coming to us through our brothers and sisters in Christ. So that is a change, right? That instead of the eldest being the teachers and the youngest being the learners, all of us come to learn. All of us come with a curious spirit and all of us come believing that others have something to contribute. We do that by issuing very clear invitations to participate where all feel welcomed individually and included in the whole. Then there is the spirit of invitation that each of us has something to teach. This is a picture of one of our vibrant cross-gen ministries um, at the Tri-Saints where I was previously, where each of these people in this picture is a learner, but also each of the people in this picture is a teacher. And each of them has a gift and something that they are willing to lead, and also each of them is willing to learn from the others. We remember that each generation has something to share, that everyone is an expert in their own lived experience. We remember that elders do often have amazing wisdom if we intentionally slow down for it. Sometimes it means taking the time to listen to a story right? And providing the space to do so. Youth often have enthusiasm if we are willing to catch it. I think of a time when we were doing uh, summer Sunday school outside on the lawn and the youth and children were doing a relay race and the older folks actually were holding onto pom-poms and making up their own cheers and that they were cheering on. That was their gift, right? To get them all going. And so there's, there's a way that each of us can also reach the enthusiasm of our youth who might not have expertise, and yet they do certainly have something to teach us. In other places where I've done cross-gen, it's really helpful to have teaching pairs of different generations. So you might pair a youth with an elder or a child with a middle-aged person, and that the two of them together can be leaders supporting one another, that when one is nervous, the other one is there to uphold them and, and be with them. Or as in the case of CDT, you can specifically invite each learner to reflect on what they know and encourage sharing. For instance, the young girl in the purple, my eldest daughter is a singer. So she always taught the song every week. And the little boy at the bottom, he was the prayer. I mean, he was on fire for the Lord and they would repeat whatever he prayed. And he felt so included because he had a part where he got to lead the whole group. The sixth spirit is the spirit of tenacity. For those of you who have seen Frozen 2, one of the principles of Frozen 2 is that water remembers its shape. Um, in Frozen 2, it's a great thing because Olaf, this, this snowman, gets wiped out in this big flood. But in the end, because water remembers its shape, he's able to be remade out of that water, refrozen and made into a snowman again. For us who are trying to affect change in cross-generational ministry, it can actually be a little bit of a detriment and that's where our spirit of tenacity comes. In. Because water remembers its shape and changing shape requires consistent support. We know that in our church's institutional memory is strong and it is easy to slip back into our old habits. We know that paradigm shift and culture change requires consistent leading and advocacy, especially in small churches where it might be one person leading the charge. Um, it's really important to engage a partner in this work to help you to stay the course and that might not be within your congregation. It might be a, a small cohort of others who are doing the same work. And then it becomes a cycle of spirits to cast the vision, to invite, to train, to cast the vision, to invite, to train, to cast the vision. You get what I'm saying. It's not a checklist that you get to mark off and you're done. It's a cycle that requires constant um, um, 
revisiting, to come back again and again and again. And I would encourage you, we're going to give you a sheet that says everything that I just said. So don't worry if you didn't take all your notes. Um, to actually have this somewhere where you can be reminded that each of these spirits, all six of these spirits, experimentation, teamwork, vibrancy, curiosity, invitation, and tenacity, are like all the balls you have to keep up all the time. Again, it's why you need a team. It's why you need someone to help you stay the course. And that these are not done. It's back again and back again and back again. But the thing is, when you bring these generations together, their spirit is what will help to carry it forward. Your cheerleading and their spirit, because the energy when you get everyone working together is absolutely the most thing that I've been a part of in these last eight years.